Hello, can you hear me? In Zoom? Hey, Adrian? Uh, yes, Prof, can you, I can hear you. Oh, great. So I assume everyone in the Zoom can hear me. All right, I guess this is all the people we have today. So unfortunately or fortunately, this is the last lecture. Um, so we are going to wrap up uh, what, we are, what we have discussed about the central limit theorem. And uh, we will provide many examples. Today, we will talk about the central limit theorem as well as something called the continuity correction, which is the, the second part of, I think, um, section. 5.4 of the book, all right? So you don't, you don't need to know the whole of section chapter five, but you need to know the whole of section 5.4 only, okay? So we will look at some very uh, nice problems. Some problems that I, go, I come across, uh, I, I'm, I'm going through today are not in the book. So I made them up. So you might want to copy or you might want to just listen, right? So what is the central limit theorem? The central limit theorem concerns a sequence of IID random variables. These things here have names, all right? This is an acronym. And this acronym stands for independent and identically distributed. So obviously, by now, you should know what is independent, that means all the random variables here are mutually independent. They are joint probability distribution, probability mass function or probability density function factorizes. So if I take any two of them, say x1, x2, okay, then they factorize into f of x1, f of x2. That is the meaning of independence. And we can do this for n random variables, okay? So that's the meaning of independence. By identical distributedness, we mean that all of them have the same PDF or TMF. All of them. It doesn't mean that the random variables are the same. It means that their underlying PDF and PMFs are the same. And we will see examples of this to illustrate this in a very short moment. So the central limit theorem concerns a sequence of ID random variables. Okay? So these are ID random variables are called x1, x2, x3, and so on, so forth. Infinitely many. Okay? If you're interested in this topic, then you can attend my uh, other class where I talk about many random variables. Okay? Beyond ID random variables. Okay? So all these random variables have a comp because they have the same PMF and they have the same PDF. So clearly, they have the same mean and they have the same variance. So we can give a single uh, notation symbol for the mean, and we can give the variance a single symbol as well. All right, this symbol is mu. It's just a u. All right, this is called sigma squared. That is the variance. These are the usual symbols for mean and variance. Because all of them have the same distribution, they have the same mean, they have the same variance. Okay? So we are going to create now a new random variable. Let's call it Zn. Zn is the sum of the first n x random variables minus n times the mean divided by square root n standard deviation. Okay, so this is a brand new random variable that is comprised of the first n random variables. Take away the mean and divided by square root times the standard deviation. And it has the following properties. The expectation value of Zn is equal to zero, not one. And the variance of Zn is equal to one. And this holds for all n bigger than one. You can check this. We checked this last time. I'm not going to check this anymore. So they are all called normalized, all right? The variance does not become too small or too big. It always stays at one. All right, the central limit theorem is the following statement. Uh, the cumulative distribution function of the newly created random variable Zn converges to the cumulative distribution function of a standard 
Gaussian random variable as the number of copies of, as the number of random variables n becomes very large, tends to infinity. So mathematically, we can write the CDF as f of Zn, Z, that is the probability that Zn is less than or equal to Z. We, when we say that some number converges to some number, we mean that as the index here becomes very, very large, then this, num this sequence of numbers here converges or goes towards phi of Z, which is the integral from minus infinity to Z standard Gaussian. Okay, here as n tends to infinity. All right. Now, in order for me to describe what is the meaning of n tends to infinity and this limiting operation, we need maybe three weeks. But as you know, we don't have any more three weeks. Okay, we only have a few more minutes left in this class. So I cannot really tell you what is n tends to infinity in a formal way. Okay, that belongs to a math class. But nevertheless, we can do some um, simple examples. But roughly speaking, as n becomes large, we have that the left-hand side is getting closer and closer to the right-hand side. So we may write this. And this approximation, approximation sign is becoming, the accuracy is better and better as the number of copies increases. Okay? Now, this holds true for all. Uh, this is the for all, but let me write in English. For all, Z in R. Okay, so that is the essence of the central limit theorem. Okay, so now let's do a couple of examples before I do. I go to continuity correction. So example. So there are n voters, and we want to record. Record what we are going to record the fraction. M n. Who voted? in favor of a candidate of say Donald Trump, okay? So Donald Trump is running against Joe Biden. So we are, we're gonna record the empirical fraction of the people who voted for Trump in favor of Biden. Say no one uh, damages his or her vote. Now P is a number between zero and one. Say is the fraction of people in the whole population that support Trump. So that is some number that we don't know. This is some number that we don't know. All right. Perhaps 40% of people support Trump. But when people come into the voting booth, all right, there could be some randomness. Okay. And furthermore, not everybody in the USA will come to the voting booth. All right, maybe only 50% will come. So you have a bias sample. And so among the 50% of people, you may not get exactly, exactly 40% who vote for Donald Trump. All right, so that fraction is called the empirical fraction MN, which is X1 plus dot, 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 plus XN divided by N. So those are the people, the N people who walk into the voting booth. And those people who voted for Donald Trump, their XI is one. So we are recording the fraction of people who voted for Donald Trump, okay? So we can model each person, each random variable, each person who voted, who walked into the voting booth as XI is a Bernoulli random variable with probability of success, P. Success here means we voted for Donald Trump, okay? Here, MN is called the empirical or the sample proportion. Supports Trump. And support our candidate Trump. Okay, so we are interested in the following. We are interested when we do polling. We are interested in the probability that the empirical fraction deviates from the true proportion by more than a certain fraction epsilon. This this symbol here is called epsilon. I.e. The polling error is larger than some desired accuracy. So the 
question is, how many people do I have to poll to be able to get within, say, this is 0 0.01 of the true proportion of people that voted for Donald Trump? I want to learn what fraction of the whole population actually likes Trump. How many people do I have to poll? Don't you think this is a very important question? Now, if I only poll 10 people, all right, it may not be accurate enough, right? Because all 10 people might love Donald Trump. But if I poll 1 million people, okay, it's more reliable, right? That's why we need to learn the central limit theorem. Okay, so we want to try to understand how many people we should poll in order to come close to the actual proportion, which is called P here, all right? So we are interested in the following probability, this probability here, and we are going to control it using the central limit theorem, okay? So let's try to control this in a systematic fashion. Okay, so we can assume, and here we are going to make some assumptions, mn minus p bigger than some polling error epsilon is roughly two times the probability that mn minus p is bigger than epsilon. So here we are assuming that the distribution of mn is symmetric around p. Okay, it's like a Gaussian. So B, so left side, right side has the same probability. So the probability that we deviate, so here is P. So here is our number line, and this is P, and this is our epsilon interval, epsilon here, epsilon here. We are interested in this region here. This region here, say from zero here, one, we are interested in the yellow region. And the yellow region, Okay, on the left side and the right side, we assume it's equal. Okay, that doesn't really mean that P is exactly in the middle one half. But this is not a bad approximation. Okay, now we can calculate the variance of MN. Okay, now what is MN? Notice that MN is this guy here. So we have to try to understand the variance of this random variable. This is a random variable because it is a function of N random variables. So we, when we do this, all the people here are independent. One over n squared variance of x1 plus dot 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 plus variance of xn. Okay, so all the guys are independent. And as you know, you hopefully would know by now, you need to bring out n as n squared. Okay, but all the variances are the same. And in particular, all these are Bernoulli random variables. So they have variance P times one minus P, okay? By now you should know this, but in case you don't, I remind you that variance of X1 is equal to the second moment minus the first moment, all squared here. And so that you get P minus P squared, which is P one minus P, all right? So you need to know how to do this calculation. So oftentimes we are very conservative. All right, we do not want to arbitrarily assume that 40% of people uh, vote or like Donald Trump. Okay, so what is the largest possible variance over all possible P's? Okay, the fact is that we can obtain an upper bound on the variance, upper bound of the deviation probability minus P bigger than epsilon here. This is called epsilon in mathematics by assuming the largest possible variance. Thank you very much. I am indeed incorrect. Thank you very much. Times n. And so this becomes one over n p1 minus p. Thank you. Okay. So we can obtain an upper bound of the probability by assuming the largest variance. All right. So that is the worst case scenario. Now, p times one minus p, you can sketch it like this. I think it's easy to verify. This is the function p times one minus p. There is P, this is zero, one, and a special number half. It is convex, concave like this. That means 
and the maximum is one. The maximum, no, 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 is one quarter. Okay, it looks like this. Okay, so the variance is definitely upper bounded by. I'm gonna say let me go directly to variance of m n is directly upper bounded by one over four n. That is the worst case variance. All right. So now, how do we estimate? How do we estimate this particular probability? So we can use the central limit theorem. Probability mn minus p, okay, <coughs> bigger than epsilon, all right? This is approximately. Now, remember that we have to normalize things. We have to compute the z. You have to take the z, take away the mean, but this already has zero mean. We have taken out the mean. We need to divide by the worst case variance, one over four n, we need to take square root here. Okay, so that is the standard deviation. So this becomes two epsilon square root n. Okay, so when we try to compute this particular probability here, what we need to do is basically to estimate it using the central limit theorem. Okay, that becomes one minus phi of z. Okay, phi because this is in this side here, the phi is actually pointing in this direction. So we have the one minus. And this approximation comes about by assuming that the number of voters is large. Okay, and we can, now we can plug in the z, which is one minus phi of two epsilon square root n. Okay, so for example, if we have 100 voters and our error tolerance is 0 0.1, so we only want to come uh, within 0.1% of the actual fraction of people who love Donald Trump. We have 100 people. Now, what is the probability that 100 people, their vote, the fraction of people who actually voted for Donald Trump is within 0.1%, sorry, 0.1 of the true fraction of people that like Donald Trump, okay? So say 40% of people like Donald Trump. You have 100 people who walk into your voting booth. What is the chance that the actual fraction of people who voted for Donald Trump, this is, this is the people, number, fraction of people who like Donald Trump, all right? What is the probability that the people who walk, the 100 people who walk into the voting booth, the fraction of them who voted for Donald Trump is between 30% and 50%. That typical, okay? So we are inside this interval between 30% and 50%. We have 100 people, okay? So what is the chance that among the 100 people, 30% voted, between 30% and 50% voted for Donald Trump, when actually the true fraction of people who love Donald Trump in the population is 40%. So we can calculate this, all right? So we can plug numbers inside, okay? Assuming the worst case variance, probability of m100 minus p bigger than epsilon is approximately two times the probability m100 minus p bigger than epsilon, okay, less than approximately two times one minus phi, uh, two times 0 0.1, because epsilon is 0 0.1, times square root 100, which is, okay, whatever it is, so this becomes two minus two, phi of two, okay? Because um, I guess uh, this cancels with that. Okay, so we can look up our table. And in case you didn't, you don't know how to look up a table, four is phi of two. So here you have this table here. So phi of two, what we are looking for is exactly this number, 0 0.9772. Okay, so... Um, here. So we have this. So this becomes, uh, I just look up the table for you, 0 0.97, let's just say 977. Okay. That is equal to 0 0.046. Okay. So what this means is that, you know, the picture that I drew for you just now, let me draw again for you. So the 
real fraction of people who like Donald Trump is 0.4. What is the chance that you have 100 people who walk into the voting booth, but the empirical fraction of them actually voting for Donald Trump is unusual. Unusual in the sense that they are outside here, outside this window. So this is the unusual setting because the fraction of people who actually voted for Donald Trump is outside, okay? Basically 0.1 far away from the actual 0 0.4. Okay, and so that is a small number. It's about 5%. All right. If you increase the number of people who go into your voting booth, clearly this one will go down. Okay. Because this number here will get increased. Okay. That means the fee will become, say, three. Fee three, if you go to the table here, you go to the table. Okay. The fee three is a bigger number than 0 0.9772. It's a 0 0.9987. So if you plug this bigger number inside here, then this will definitely go down. So your sample population is more typical. Okay? You are picking more people from the population and so they will be more like the real population. And so they will be, the, the proportion will be closer to the actual number of people who actually love Donald Trump. Okay? So here is another example. Thanks for the question, Oliver. All right? So we can ask uh, the, the question, how large uh, should N be such that our estimate is within 0 0.01 of P, the true proportion with probability at least 95%. Okay, so we want to be 95% sure that actually the fraction of people who voted for Donald Trump is within 0.01% of the total number of people that love Donald Trump. Okay, so let's see. We can solve an equation. We have this 2 minus 2, phi of 2 times epsilon times square root n. We equate it to... 0 0.05. So that is the deviation. Okay. Away here will have 0 0.05 uh, fraction. Okay. That is 5%. So that's the unusual atypical setting. Okay. So we basically can solve for this. Phi of uh, 2, now the epsilon here is 0 0.01. Square root n is equal to 0 0.975. Okay, so this 2 times 0 0.01, let me just write it as 0 0.02, square root n would be, so how do we find this 0 0.975? So we go to this table here. Where is 975? Mm, here, uh, located it here. So can you see that? Wow. So where is this 1.96, I believe? You have to go in here and then you have to circle this and then you look at this and you look at this, 1.96, okay? So you have this 1.96 here. And then you solve for N here. And after you are all said and done. Okay, after you're said and done, this is going to be 9,604, roughly. So we need, we need roughly 9,604 voters to be 95% sure that MN, all right, which is their voting proportion in favor of Donald Trump, is within 0 0.01 of the real percentage or proportion of people who really like Donald Trump. Okay, now you notice that here we need a lot more people, okay, than the 100. This is because our threshold here is much smaller. This is 0 0.01 above or 0 0.1. So if you want to get really close to the real fraction of people like Donald Trump, then you need to encourage more people to vote in order to get a better sense of the population, right? Is that clear? Valencia, is that clear? Oh, very good. So let me go through one more example, then I will go through the continuity correction, okay? 
So this is a very important example when you want to invite friends to your house for a party. Now that you can invite friends to a house for your party. Okay. Now you invite, you have invited 64 guests. Uh, this 64 is N. N equals to 64 guests to your house, uh, to your party. Now you know that each friend, each friend uh, needs zero, one, two sandwiches. Some people don't need to eat sandwiches, but each friend needs to eat zero, one, two sandwiches with probability one over four, one over two, and one over four respectively. Okay, so you know that. So some people want to eat two sandwiches. Some people don't need to eat any. So we are interested in to find the number of sandwiches we have to cook. So that with uh, probability, with probability at least 95%, everyone will have, uh, there's no shortage. Okay. So we prepare enough sandwiches for our guests. So how many do we have to, we suppose with probability one, we want everyone to be happy. How many sandwiches should we prepare? With probability one, that means definitely we, everyone will have his or her fill. Oliver, how many sandwiches should we prepare? Huh? Oh, uh, what, how many sandwiches should we prepare? Yes, we should prepare one, two, eight sandwiches because everybody can only eat up to two sandwiches. We have 64 guests. So if we prepare one, two, eight sandwiches, we are definitely fine. But suppose, uh, we are okay with taking a chance of 5% that someone goes hungry. We have 5%, okay? How many sandwiches should we prepare? Okay, so consider the random variable S equals to X1 plus X2 plus dot, 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 plus Xn, uh, 64. Okay, where each Xi uh, is a random variable that takes on uh, the value 0, 1, 2, with probability, with probability, uh, quarter, half, quarter, respectively. Okay? So that is a logical way to set up the problem. All right? Everybody is a random variable, and it can take on value 0, 1, 2, respectively. And we are our goal. What is our goal? How do we phrase this problem mathematically? Our goal is to find the smallest, uh, let's call it Z, such that the probability that S is less than equal to Z is bigger than 0 0.95. So with probability at least 95%, the total number of sandwiches that is requested is less than Z. Less than Z. So we are looking for the smallest possible Z such that with probability higher than 95%, the total number of sandwiches that is requested is less than Z. Is that clear? Perfectly clear, right? So we are going to use the central limit theorem to estimate this. Um, because the book uses Z for something else, let me use something else here. Let's point um, A. Okay, so we want to find the smallest integer A. So what we, what, because we can only prepare integer number of sandwiches, we'll see, okay? So uh, let us estimate expected value of Xi. Okay, so that is expected value is zero times a quarter plus one times half plus uh, two times quarter. So what is this? Uh, half, half, one. So now let's compute the variance. In order to do so, we compute the second moment. Two squared times quarter. This is what? Three over two. So hopefully by now you would know how to compute the variance. That will be the second moment minus the first moment or squared, which is half. Okay, I will not talk about how to compute these things. So now we will try to estimate A here. We want to find the smallest possible integer A. This is an integer. And here's the natural numbers, okay? 
this is a method. S less than A. How do we calculate this? So we take away the mean from the top and the bottom. But how many do we have? So we have 64. 64 times 1 divided by square root 64 times standard deviation, which is this. The variance is half. The standard deviation is square root half. Then we have to do A minus the same thing, 64 divided by the same thing at the bottom, 60, uh, 64 times square root half. Okay, we want, so this by the central limit theorem, by central limit theorem, this is phi of A minus 64 over, uh, this is uh, eight times, uh, square root one over two. So we want this to be bigger than 0 0.95, okay? So we go back to our table and find where is the 0 0.95. So let's open our eyes big, big, and then we will see zero, where's 95? Uh, here, between here and here, right? So we interpolate between, so 1.645. 1 so we need to go in between here, 1.645, okay? Can you see? All right, so, this is roughly a minus 64 over eight square root one half is bigger than zero point, what did I say? 1.645 from the table. Now, from here on, you're gonna massage this by yourself. I'm not gonna type in the calculator. So a must be bigger than 73.3, okay? But you cannot make 0.3 sandwiches, can you? Right, you cannot make 0.3 sandwiches. So if we make, if we prepare 74 sandwiches, then with probability at least 95%, all guests are satisfied. All guests have their fill. So that's the way to do these sort of things. We compute the mean, we compute the variance, we put it into here, then the formula, this is the mean. So this is 64 times this, okay? And then we need to compute the standard deviation is the square root of this one here, okay? You cannot forget the n. You cannot forget the square root n here. You need to carry it, all right? So now this guy here, on the left-hand side, this guy here now behaves like a standard normal. And that's what we will replace it by. This is the standard normal CDF. Standard Gaussian CDF. Okay. And we equate it to here, 95%. And then we go to our table. And then we find out the CDF, the value here, 1.645. And then the rest is mechanical. Understand? Got it? Is this very clear? Okay. So the central limit theorem plays the role here. Okay. Because this is, a, this is difficult to deal with. All right. If we want to understand the distribution of S, we need to go and sum up or convolve a lot of these uh, independent random variables. And these are very complicated things. 64 convolutions. Actually 63 only but it's still very messy. So we are just going to sweep everything under the rug and, and basically uh, leverage their independence in order for us to estimate this particular probability using that of a Gaussian. And we are all set and done, okay? So the last thing, Oliver, okay? This is the procedure. This is the procedure. This is just some algorithm. There are only three steps, okay? You understand all these steps properly, you will be able to get one part of one question on the final. You need to know this procedure. If you know this procedure, I guarantee you can get one, one you can get 10 marks on the final, 10 out of 100. I tell you already, you need to know this if you're interested in getting 10 marks, okay? So now I want to go through the last thing, which um, is just a small little refinement. Okay, the book calls it the, the Moivre, I don't know how to pronounce this, Laplace, this problem. 
approximation to the binomial. This one also has another name. When I learned it, it's called continuity correction, but it's a very small little thing. Continuity correction to the binomial. Okay, so we have a random variable as n is a binomial with parameter n. The number of trials n. And a binomial is also characterized by the probability of success. T, which is the number between zero and one. It's a probability. So here you're tossing n coins and every time you succeed, that means you succeed, uh, you got hits with probability P. So you can create from here a binomial random variable. Okay, you can regard as n as a sum of n Bernoulli random variables. Bernoulli means a one zero random variable. Xi is a Bernoulli random variable with success P. Then of course, by now you should know this is pretty, uh, you, you really need to know this. Expected value of Xi is P and the variance of Xi, you can compute using the uh, second moment minus the first moment squared formula. But no matter how you do it, you must know that it's P, P1 minus P for Bernoulli. Okay, and we are interested in, for example, Okay, so you can think of all these x1 to xn as the people who come to the voting booth and they record one if they vote for Donald Trump. So sn is the total number of people who voted for Donald Trump out of n. All right, and we are interested in this probability. The number of people who voted for Donald Trump is between k and l. Now, this one can be calculated exactly, but it's very troublesome because how would you do this? you will basically have to do the sum over all possible k, uh, this is not k, not very good, j running from k to l of n choose j, p to the j, one minus p to the n minus j. This is the exact formula for a binomial probability mass function. Now, this one, if n is very large, you put it into a computer, it's going to be very unstable. You can try. Why is it unstable? This is numerical analysis, which is not taught here, but this is common sense also. Right, so suppose uh, you are very lucky and uh, a lot of people showed up to your voting booth. Say 1 million people showed up. And also 1 million people showed up. Okay, 1 million is not like that. 10 to the 6 people show up. And you're interested in the total number of people between 900,000 who voted for Donald Trump. Okay, so, oh, sorry. One million people showed up. This, this, okay. And we are interested in say between 500,000 people voted for Donald Trump and 510,000 people voted for Donald Trump. You plug into this formula, what will go wrong? What does common sense tell you? What do you have to compute? You have to compute this one million 1 million, choose 500,000. You put this into your MATLAB or Python, what will happen? Yes, exactly. Oliver said it right. If you do this inside the computer, it will explode. Go and try. It will explode in your face. Okay, and if you have this, this is 40% uh, of people love Donald Trump. You do this to the power of 500,000 what would this become? Very, very small. So it's very, very unstable to do this. So you got a huge number here and you have a very small number here. It's very unstable. So we want to be able to estimate the left-hand side using a quick and dirty method. Right, by the central limit theorem, okay, by the central limit theorem, okay, we have that the pro we can actually control we can actually um, estimate the left-hand side by means of the following. Okay, we can just take away NP divided by, remember, you have to put N here and you have to put the variance here. Okay, less than SN minus, this exact square root NP, one minus P less than L minus NP over square root NP, one minus P. 
Okay, this is exact. We have not done by the central limit theorem yet. And here is where the central limit theorem comes in. We are saying that actually this can be estimated using phi of L minus NP divided by NP one minus P minus phi of K minus NP divided by square root NP one minus P. Okay, so why is that the case? Well, we have a in, we are basically, okay, this should be approximation by the central limit theorem, okay? So we're interested in um, this random variable being sandwiched by this and that, okay? So let's say the left-hand side is called um, A and the right-hand side, mm, let's use a different color. This is called A and this is called B, all right? So A is here, B is here. We are interested in the probability of this part here. Of course, the probability of this part is the probability that you have this part here all the way to the left, which is captured by this probability of B, less than B. And then to subtract this part here, which is this. We have done this many times in this class. You're interested in the probability of a certain interval. You take all the way to the left-hand side and then all the way to the left-hand side for B and A, you subtract them. We have done this before, okay? In some homework. Okay, so this is um, one way that you can estimate this and it's pretty good, okay? But, so what, what are we doing here? Here we are treating, we are treating um, SN as a standard normal, as a, sorry, a normal random variable with mean NP and standard deviation and P one minus P with a square root. Okay, so we are treating it as a normal random variable. Well, actually, I'm already very happy with this, but you can do a little bit better. We can be slightly more accurate. We can be slightly more accurate by replacing k by k minus uh, replacing k by hang on uh, k is a smaller one mm, k we replace k by k minus half and l by l plus half respectively okay so this is called the continuity correction. It's not so important, but roughly speaking, here is the picture, okay? You have a certain uh, uh, distribution that looks like this. And the integer points, the integer value points are the following. Okay, so what I've drawn here are the integers. And we are interested in our... Uh, the distribution, a probability of us ranging from K to L, where K is here and L here, okay? So if we just look at K and L, what we are actually sweeping out is this area here, exactly K and L without continuity correction of half, half, okay? This. One of the big problems, if we just use the normal approximation without correction, is that if K, is exactly equal to L. This is exactly equal to L. K is exactly equal to L. Then this one gives zero. All right, because here you, these, two are, these two numbers are the same. But the binomial random variable evaluated at a certain integer is not zero. Okay, so we can do a little bit better by the following observation. Let us just increment L by half. Okay. Let me just increment L up to this point here. So that is L plus half. All right. And let me decrement K by half. This is very empirical. But it, people observe that this will do better as an approximation, as we will see from an example. Okay, this is L plus half. That means we are picking up some slightly more mass here. We are picking up this part here as well as this part here. That is called the De Moivre-Laplace approximation. 
okay? And so if we use this approximation, then our approximation is the following, okay? So we will have this being equal Instead of L here, we will have continuity correction plus half, ah, very ugly, minus NP and K, we will have to decrement it minus half minus NP. So that is our correction, okay? So that is the small little correction that one does. For binomial, we only do this for binomial, okay? So in the final few minutes, let me just do an example. There is no proof or guarantee as to why this is good. We just observe empirically, okay? Let Sn be a binomial with n equals to 36 and probability success equals to half, okay? So we are interested in the probability that Sn is less than 21. Let's use the central, let's look at the exact expression. So k running from zero to the 21, 36 choose k, half to the power k, and half, actually this is one minus half, to the power 36 minus k. But for binomials uh, with probability of success half, this is actually going to be half to the power 36 exactly. All right, we always have this beautiful thing because we have this cancellation. Right, so now, we can actually plug into a calculator and compute this exactly, 8785. For this simple case of p equals a half, we can actually do things in a stable manner, okay? Re reasonably stable manner. Now, the CLT, the central limit theorem, gives us the following. Probability, Sn less than 21. Well, this is approximately phi of, you take 21 minus 36 times half, that is the mean, divided by the square root of the number, and the var variance is square root P1 minus P, okay? This one is phi of, okay, 36 minus half is how much is, times half is uh, 18, so three, three, here three divided by six times half. Oh, exactly one, just nice. Sorry, I'm doing this a little bit fast, but this is all calculation. So phi of one, again, we can refer to our table. What is phi of one? Oh, we notice that this is 0 0.8413, okay? So that is 0 0.8413. Okay, so as you can see, not bad, not bad, but not so good because maybe we are about 4% off. The central limit theorem is 4% off from the exact value, all right? Now, if we do continuity correction, approximation, perhaps we can do better. Probability Sn less than 21. Now, if we are interested in less than equal to 21, we add half, okay? This is approximately phi of 21 plus half minus 36 times half divided by the usual thing at the bottom, 36, and this is square root, half, one minus half. So this gives phi of, I don't know, but it's something, 1.17, okay? After you, you settle all this using a calculator. So now we go to this and we look at the 1.17, where is it? 1.17 uh, here. Is this better? 770. 877. 0 0.877. 0 0.877. Okay. So we notice that, oh, gee, we are better. We are closer to 0 0.8785. All right. So we are doing a bit better and we are happier. And this is due to the continuity correction here. Okay, a little bit better, all right? But the theory tells us that if we use a central limit theorem and N is big enough, these two will definitely go to each other, definitely. That's the theory. 
here the problem here there's a big gap is because this is not big enough that's why the university tells us professors that if our class size is smaller than 40 maybe we don't need to follow the curve too too much because here you see there's a big gap and the number of students here only 36 all right that's why if we really want to follow the curve we have to use the the Moira Laplace approximation is a bit better. All right, 36 is a bit too small. Okay. So nevertheless, if this is very large, say 100, we can expect that this is very close. Really. And try. Okay, I've said everything I wanted to say. I don't have anything more to say. I hope the people in Zoom still can hear me. Hey, Sean, why are you not here? I thought you'd like to be here. Anyway, I've said everything I wanted to say in this whole course. I hope you like the course and you don't find it a, a pain. I know everyone has to go through this. So whether or not you like it or not, there's no choice to take this. But hopefully you didn't find a waste of time. Right, Oliver? <laughs> so uh, hopefully our paths cross again. And uh, I wish you the best for the exam. But for those people in my tutorial, and even those people not in my tutorial, you are free to attend my tutorial on Thursday over Zoom because we cannot have it in person. If you don't want to attend, also okay, it's recorded. Okay? What? <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. This is the end of the lecture series. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, hopefully, I see you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Prof. Yes, what? Uh, who in the Zoom is talking to me? Yes, what's the question? Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Do people here have any questions? Javen, oh, thank you. Take care. Maybe I'll see you at the tutorial. Oh, Samuel Ku. Who is Samuel Ku? Samuel Ku just sent me an email.